For the, the first order of business today is a panel centering on criminal justice trends and potential reform. Uh, the Federal Society is a society for law and public policy, and this panel is sure to offer a little bit of both. Um, and I have the pleasure right now of introducing the person who will be guiding us through this conversation. Uh, Andrew English is the general counsel for the Kentucky Justice and Public Safety Cabinet. He is an Oldham County native, holding a bachelor's degree in poli-sci and communication, as well as a master's degree in communication from Hofstra University. He received his law degree and a master's degree in public policy from the College of William and Mary. During law school, he clerked for the Senate Judiciary Committee and then the ranking member, Senator Jeff Sessions. Following law school, Andrew joined the United States Navy JAG Corps, where he served as both a prosecutor and a criminal defense attorney. During his time in the Navy, Andrew deployed to the Persian Gulf with Amphibious Squadron 8 and the 24th Marine Expeditionary, Expeditionary Unit aboard the USS Iwo Jima. He's now a Lieutenant Commander in the U.S. Navy Reserve. <clears throat> Following leaving active duty, Andrew is appointed by Governor Bevan and Secretary Tilley to the position of General Counsel. As General Counsel, Andrew manages a team of over 40 lawyers, paralegals, and investigators and he's responsible for all legal matters involving the cabinet, the Department of Corrections, the Department of Juvenile Justice, the Kentucky State Police, and the Department of Criminal Justice Training. So if we could welcome Andrew. Thank you all, I appreciate it. Um, first and foremost, I'd like to thank our opening act, Senator McConnell. Uh, I'd like to uh, personally thank him for all his hard work with the federal judiciary. It will truly be a part of his lasting and enduring legacy as one of our senators. Uh, the senator brought up the idea of being intimidated by those who are around you. And as I sit here following him and sitting in this panel, I truly, truly, truly know what he means. Uh, in doing so, uh, we, I will introduce the panel, give them a brief opportunity to introduce themselves. Then we will go into some questions that I prepared, followed by a Q&A at the end, time permitting. Uh, to my far left, Judge Danny Reeves is a federal uh, judge on the United States District Court for the Eastern District of Kentucky. He joined the court in 2001 after being nominated by President George W. Bush. On March 15, 2016, President Barack Obama nominated Judge Reeves to the position of the United States Sentencing Commission, which will expire in October 31 of 2021. Judge, do you have any opening comments, sir? Uh, just, just a few opening comments. Um, you know, one of the things that we overlook sometimes uh, is the audience, and um, I just wonder, how many of y'all have experience with in the, on the criminal side of things? Just so we'll, so maybe about half. So I, we'll, as a as a panel, we'll try to um, make sure that we do explain some of the terms that that we'll be using today. I think we're going to be talking about some. Uh, to me, some really interesting uh, issues with uh, sentencing and some criminal justice reform. And, and I would just suggest as we use these terms that we think about what they really mean, what does reform mean, for example, uh, and what are the consequences of, uh, of reform. Thank you, Judge. On my right, U.S. Attorney Robert Duncan. He is the U.S. Attorney for the Eastern District of Kentucky. He was nominated by President Donald Trump on August 3rd, 2017, and confirmed by the United States Senate on November 9th, 2017. Prior to his appointment, Mr. Duncan has served for more than a decade as Assistant U.S. Attorney for the Eastern District of Kentucky, beginning in 2011 and continuing until his appointment as the U.S. Attorney. Duncan focused on the prosecution of organized crime, uh, organized crime drug enforcement task, task force cases, working with federal, state, and local law enforcement personnel uh, to disrupt and dismantle complex drug trafficking and money laundering organizations operating in the district uh, and elsewhere. From 2007 to 2013, Duncan served as coordinator for the Office of Project Safe Neighborhood Program, a Department of Justice initiative to reduce gun, gang, and criminal violence through, through education, community outreach, and prosecution. Mr. Duncan, do you have anything you'd like to add? Thank you, Andrew. Just uh, briefly, uh, good morning, everyone. It's my pleasure to be here uh, on this panel uh, this morning. Uh, thank you all for the opportunity to, uh, to present. 
Uh, as Andrew indicated, I was an assistant U.S. attorney in my office. I spent nearly 13 uh, years as an assistant uh, prosecuting drug trafficking, violent crime cases. Uh, now, as the U.S. attorney, it's my privilege to uh, lead and to serve with approximately 100, uh, 100 folks uh, spread over three staffed offices. Uh, of those 100 people, 50, uh, approximately 50 are lawyers. Um, these folks are career prosecutors that are committed to upholding the rule of law and ensuring that, that justice is done. As Andrew indicated, um, the opioid uh, epidemic has really been the, uh, one of the, the most pressing issues that um, I've had to face both as an assistant U.S. attorney and now as the U.S. attorney. And President Trump has made it uh, one of the uh, priorities uh, for the Department of Justice. Look forward to uh, discussing um, this topic and uh, the issue of, of reform uh, with you all today. Thank you. Uh, to my far right, Ms. Luann Redcorn, who is the Fayette County Commonwealth Attorney. Governor Bevan appointed Ms. Redcorn to her position in October 1st, 2016. She is a career prosecutor, and before assuming her current role, she worked in the Fayette Com County Commonwealth Attorney's Office since 1987 working as assistant, commonwealth attorney, and then first assistant since 2006. She has tried more than 225 felony cases, including 51 homicides. She has helped establish the Fayette County Child Sexual Abuse Multidisciplinary Team in 1989. She also helped write Kentucky's first model protocol for child sexual abuse multidisciplinary teams and was the co-author of Kentucky's Attorney General's Child sex abuse manual in 2003. Ms. Redcorn, do you have anything you'd like to say? Well, good morning. Thank you for allowing me to be here in the panel, kind of last minute. I need to say that I've now had 52 murder trials, okay. um, having Correct successfully that. prosecuted one uh, last week, and that was where I was hoping to be today. Unfortunately, the case was continued, and, and so I have the great opportunity to be here. Um, I don't set policy in the Fayette Commonwealth Attorney's Office. I'm a law enforcement person. It's my responsibility to uphold the law. But I think that in the last uh, 33 years since I've been a prosecutor, the role of the prosecutor has changed tremendously in communities. And I think our responsibility goes beyond simply enforcing the law, but looking for ways to have a meaningful impact on crime in our communities. And some of the things that are on the table for discussion today are certainly a part of that. So thank you. Thank you, ma'am. Uh, last but certainly not least, uh, Daniel Cameron is an associate at Frost, Brown & Todd in Louisville and is the spokesperson for the Kentucky Smart on Crime Association. Daniel focuses his practice on advising clients regarding government and public policy matters. Uh, prior to joining Frost, Brown & Todd here in Kentucky, the Kentucky native served in D.C. as legal counsel for the Senate Majority Leader, uh, Senator McConnell. In his role, Daniel handled uh, a robust uh, legislative profile which required a deep understanding of the federal judiciary, law enforcement and criminal justice matters, uh, patent and trademark issues, and Kentucky telecommunications and broadband initiatives. Mr. Cameron. Thanks, Andrew. I'd just like to say uh, you know, there was a game you used to play called uh, one of these things is not alike. And so you've got a state prosecutor, a federal prosecutor, and a judge, an associate at a law firm. Uh, <laughs> You can bet which one, you can count which one is not alike here. But uh, I'm honored uh, to be up here with uh, these distinguished colleagues uh, to talk about an issue that is dear to my heart and, and certainly uh, something that I believe here in the Commonwealth we are looking seriously at and critically uh, in terms of what are next steps, uh, what public safety looks like as we kind of move forward in this decade. And so I'm thankful and grateful for the opportunity. Thanks. Thank you. So kicking off with our first question. Three days ago, President Trump declared the opioid crisis a national public health emergency. We have had more than 300,000 Americans die from the opioid overdoses pandemic since, two, since the year 2000. In Kentucky this year, we hit an all-time record high in prison population at just over 25,000 people in, the, in state custody in our county jails and prisons. This year, the budget for the Kentucky Department of Corrections is over $600 million uh, of taxpayer funds. Much of the growth in our population and the cost is directly related to the opioid crisis. Question, I'm gonna throw this to you, Mr. Duncan. What can we do in the criminal justice world to combat this crisis 
while we get the best out of our public safety dollars? Thank you, Andrew. That's, uh, that's a difficult question that I know that many uh, folks at the state level, not only here in Kentucky, are, are grappling with, but also at the federal level. The uh, response of the Department of Justice uh, regarding opioids is we've taken a, a three-pronged approach, um, and that's based on focusing on treatment, focusing on prevention, and certainly focusing on uh, aggressive enforcement of the, the federal drug laws. Uh, let me say at the outset, the department is supportive of folks seeking treatment. Uh, those uh, people that are struggling with addiction that need help, uh, we are supportive of uh, them seeking and receiving that help. We're not advocating for a particular type of treatment. I think that is uh, best left to the individual uh, who is in need. But we are uh, consistent that we are supportive of uh, treatment efforts. Another um, facet, and I think it is, is very important and is also tied in with um, enforcement really, is, is prevention. Uh, the more folks that we can prevent from becoming addicted uh, to opiates and opioids, the better off that we are um, both at, at the state level and at the federal level. The department um, sponsors a number of take back or a number of uh, prevention initiatives uh, for instance, at the national level, uh, just last weekend was the National Drug Take Back Day, uh, where we had uh, an event in Lexington. Um, those things, you know, events like that, encourage um, members of the community to, to get out and get involved in our prevention efforts. Locally, uh, one of our, if not the, uh, the key prevention effort that our office is engaged in is the USA HEAT program, that is the Heroin Education Action Team. It was started uh, in 2015 by my predecessor, Carrie Harvey, and members uh, of the office that are, that are still there and still involved in the program. And it brings together uh, those individuals who have lost loved ones to uh, overdose, either opiate or opioid overdose. Uh, you have mothers and fathers, brothers, sisters, aunts and uncles that are willing to meet uh, and to share their stories with community groups, school groups. We've even done uh, presentations uh, in correctional facilities. Recently, we did a presentation at the Fayette County Detention Center to inmates that were serving uh, sentences for various offenses, including drug offenses. We uh, believe that this is a way that we can get the message out about the dangers of drug addiction and the consequences, uh, the real life consequences of what happens once you start down that path. Uh, our HEAT program, I believe, has been very successful. We've presented since 2015 to approximately 17,000 people uh, across the state and across the region. And the HEAT program has been recognized by the department as a national uh, model for prevention initiatives. And other U.S. attorneys' offices across the country are, uh, are replicating that model, I believe, with uh, hopefully similar success. Prevention, I think, is also tied in uh, with enforcement. And you know, sometimes it takes aggressive enforcement uh, of those folks that are trafficking in drugs uh, to help our prevention efforts. The more drugs that we can take off the street, the more traffickers that we can take off the street, uh, those folks that are out peddling the poisons to our communities, uh, the better off that we are. And we're committed to using all of our available resources, all of our available tools uh, to address the problem uh, of op illegal opioid and opiate <coughs> distribution both with the illicit street drugs like heroin and fentanyl, but also with the prescription drugs. We are uh, making no distinction between those folks that are you know, drug trafficking on the street or are misusing their medical license or their uh, uh, other medical professional, professional duties uh, and putting profit over, over patient care. So we, we are being very aggressive in our efforts uh, both on both sides of the coin. Thank you. Uh, Ms. Redcorn, maybe you can give us the state perspective on that instead of the federal level. Well, um. yeah, clearly we have a, an, an opioid, we have a drug problem. I mean, we, I think that's uh, no surprise to anybody. Obviously, the crisis is because people that use opioids r run the risk of dying. And I don't think the danger can be overstated. Um, I'm sure that almost everybody in this room has somebody that they know. Uh, I have a family member who is currently incarcerated. Um, she's a uh, heroin addict, and she tells us that um, as a heroin addict, that's all you think about. 
is your next fix. So we're, we're dealing with a problem here that is very difficult uh, to overcome. From a state level, and in my office, about one-third of the cases that we prosecute are drug cases. So uh, last year, 30% of our cases were drug cases. A little more than half of that 30% were trafficking in drug cases, and a little less were possession cases. I think the, uh, our state has done a good job in increasing the penalties on heroin and fentanyl trafficking. I think that's a very good thing. I think where um, I feel like we can do better is what to do with the addicts. Uh, we arrest them, we release them, we arrest them again, we release them, we arrest them again. Right now I have a number of people who have three open cases in my office, all felonies, and all mainly tied to drugs. So my thought is let's do a better job um, and this kind of goes into the bail reform thing, but let's do a better job with people when they get arrested. We've had good results. Um, it's been years since it's been as uh, popular as with drug court. And one thing that I suggest that we consider is maybe doing something with um, addicts, people that are arrested for possession, and rather than releasing them ROR and tell them to get random drug treatment, and that's a miracle if that happens, or random drug testing, and that's a miracle if it doesn't, if, if that works, but to maybe put them straight, put them straight into some kind of treatment program. And drug court, then as a way of monitoring them, because we, there's, it's still a crime, and our office is prosecuting it, but a way to monitor behavior. Um, drug court offers swift, certain sanctions for people, and treatment. So. If we can do those two things, um, I, I think that we will begin to have some success. The other part of the cases that we prosecute, I told you 30% of them are drug cases. The next 20% are theft and receiving. And it's no surprise what those are related to, and they're related to drugs. So I think we're making some good progress, but I think we have a long way to go. Thank you. Mr. Cameron, I know Right on Crime has been very vocal on this issue. Do you have any thoughts you'd like to share? Well, I, I think... Um, what Ms. Redcorn and, and uh, what uh, Mr. Duncan said is, is very true. Look, you know, last year, the numbers in, in terms of overdose deaths in this, this Commonwealth continued to increase. Uh, uh, in 2017, I think we lost 1,565 people uh, to overdoses here in the Commonwealth. So everyone recognizes that there is a issue, an acute issue, and now we're just trying to figure out how precisely um, to, to rectify that. And so there are folks on every side of the coin, whether it be law enforcement, uh, whether it be people like Smart on Crime that are simply looking for a way uh, to address uh, this chronic uh, uh, cycle of addiction. Uh, and so what Smart on Crime, I think, um, has done is we want to try to be a good corporate or, or good partner a good, uh, with uh, our law enforcement uh, partner, partners to try to figure out uh, how do we go about um, reducing the number of people that are in jail or that are there for these non-violent type of offenses and get them the sort of treatment uh, that Ms. Redcorn spoke about? It is a, uh, a hard issue because at the same time you have to uh, pair that with the concerns about uh, public safety, right? We don't want to make, we, we want to make sure that we keep folks off the, uh, out of the streets that could you know, potentially do harm because of a, a drug addiction or to feed their addiction. Um, so it's a, a time, though, that I'm, I'm optimistic about because I know we have folks that are really trying to think through how do we go about this in a way that will in, uh, in, 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 in make sure that we have um, uh, folks that are still safe and secure in their homes, but also at the same time getting people the treatment that they need. As always, the judge gets the last word. <laughs> Just, just a couple of observations. I think we talk about the opioid crisis uh, with heroin, fentanyl, and other prescription drugs. The solution may depend upon where you sit, and I think there's a real distinction between the state level and the federal level in terms of prosecutions. Um, I think at the state level, there is more of an addiction issue because you're dealing with more straight, street level users. At the federal level, Historically, it's been very different uh, because we're not dealing with the uh, necessarily with the street level users. We're dealing with the street level dealers that are distributing drugs and killing people. 
and we're dealing with uh, the distributors above that level, the cartels, uh, who play for keeps. And, and a lot of distributors are now coming into this area from Detroit, Chicago, but the drugs are coming across the southern border from Mexico, and a lot of the fentanyl is coming from China. And it's um, large amounts. It's, uh, it's hard for us to really understand the quantities that uh, are being intercepted, and perhaps uh, Rob Duncan can speak to that a, a little better. But some of the frustration, I think, that some of the judges are seeing is that crossover area where we're, where we're dealing with addicts that, that, that are truly addicted, but they're also selling some of the drugs to maintain their habit and they're injuring or killing people. And, and I had a case a couple of years ago that kind of brings this home. We had a person that had been uh, arrested and released for trafficking in heroin. And while he was on release from the state system, he sold drugs to a lady going through postpartum depression and it killed her. And he was prosecuted, of course, for the death and he has a lengthy sentence now. Uh, but it was a fellow that had been in the system but was released because his primary problem was seen as addiction. But in fact, the real problem for the public was distribution. It wasn't addiction. And so we have to, we have to do a better job of dis making those distinctions and they're very hard distinctions to make many times. Thank you, sir. Uh, moving on to the next topic. In 1951 with the Boggs Act, we started to see the early creations of mandatory minimum sentences at the federal level. Over the years, uh, with the Anti-Drug Abuse Act of 1986, the introduction of federal sentencing guidelines, and the Three Strikes Law, we have seen the uh, expansion of mandatory minimums. And Judge, I'm going to come back to you. Uh, because I know your position with the uh, United States Federal Sentencing Commission may pre prevent you from saying th certain things, but I wanted to at least maybe get from your perspective the current status of mandatory minimums and possibly the future. Well, uh, there's, there's some legislation that's been proposed. I think it's made it through the House, but not through the Senate, and part of the First Step Act, I think, maybe addresses some of this. But I think, by and large, it's, it's fair to say that a lot of uh, district court judges really oppose mandatory minimum penalties. They think it takes away the discretion um, that they feel like they need. Um, but mandatory minimums uh, really apply in several areas. They apply not only in drug cases, but they also apply in um, sex abuse or child pornography cases. Um, they apply in gun cases. We deal with uh, stacking penalties under 924C. And uh, they apply with um, identity theft. We have a two-year mandatory minimum for identity theft. And so uh, there, there are a number of areas where Congress has determined that uh, mandatory minimums are necessary. And I think members of the Federalist Society, we have, or you need to recognize that Congress has the say in that. They make those determinations, and they can very easily change those um, those mandatory minimum penalties if they choose to do that, and part of the First Step Act does that. But I went back last night to pull some of the publications from the Sentencing Commission that deals with mandatory minimums in various areas. And since uh, early 2017, these are the reports. <laughs> it's amazing. Uh, there's a 2011, um, about a 500-page volume. Uh, there have been updates, there have been reports on mandatory minimums uh, generally, uh, also with uh, drug offenses, with firearm offenses, with sex offenses. And so the uh, Sentencing Commission is uh, pretty prolific in terms of its uh, study and its, and its reporting, and so I would um, call your attention to those if you do have specific questions. But um, the Sentencing Commission um, has taken the position that with regard to mandatory minimums, that if Congress enacts mandatory minimums either, or changes those in the future, that they should not be excessively severe, that they should be narrowly tailored to apply to those offenders who warrant the more severe punishment, and they should be applied consistently. And that's one of the problems that, that we have with uh, perhaps with changing administrations. One administration may not uh, aggressively prosecute cases or matters that uh, otherwise would be uh, a case that would call for a mandatory minimum. So you do run into some problems with uh, inconsistent application in terms of uh, charging decisions that are made. And uh, I know that that sometimes is also frustrating for the courts. We went through recently 
uh, the uh, Smart on Crime initiative in 2013. There were some changes that were made, and uh, there have been some changes since that time that have focused more on those um, cases uh, where mandatory minimums are being, uh, are being prosecuted. Uh, we, we see these mandatory minimums, and in, in really in, in drug cases, we do see some relief in terms of uh, substantial assistance. Um, and there's a, there's a real difference across the country and within, from one district to another, even in Kentucky, for example, in terms of uh, the percentage of cases in which uh, 5K motions or motions for substantial assistance are filed. So regardless of uh, how we look at mandatory minimums, there are going to be some differences with prosecutorial decisions and then decisions in, uh, at, the, at the back end in terms of uh, uh, substantial assistance. Thank you. I'm going to look over here towards my prosecutors. And I know when I was a prosecutor, things like mandatory minimums and sex offender registry and things along those lines affected how I would have prosecuted a case. How do you all see mandatory minimums uh, affecting your prosecutions? Sure. As, as Judge Reeves uh, alluded, I think the mandatory minimums, when applied consistently uh, and even handily, I think they're they're an appropriate tool. Uh, certainly, the the sentences uh, can be uh, severe, but I think in the right uh, circumstance for the right uh, offenders, um, they're appropriately so. I mean, our job as prosecutors in law enforcement is to protect the public, and we want to use uh, tools that are available to us to help us take the folks that are causing the most violence, that are uh, trafficking in the largest quantities and largest amounts of drugs, we want to, to remove them uh, from our communities and ultimately make our communities safer. There are avenues uh, of relief from mandatory minimum sentences, as uh, Judge Reeves pointed out. The avenue of cooperation with the government is, um, is an option, and often uh, with mandatory minimum sentences, um, if that is something that a person is facing, then they may have a likelihood of uh, wanting to assist the government and make other investigations and ultimately try to gain a benefit from themselves. Uh, ultimately, though, the decision of whether or not mandatory minimums uh, remain, and if they do remain, how, how they're structured is best left with the legislature. You know, as a, a law enforcement officer, as a prosecutor, we enforce the law. We don't make the law. Uh, so we will, we will adapt uh, accordingly to what the law is on the books. Now, that word mandatory minimum is not in my vocabulary, <laughs> um, but as a state prosecutor, we do have a couple of statutes that require uh, you must serve a certain amount of time until you're eligible for parole. We have the violent offender statute where you have to serve 85 percent. I think that's appropriate. I mean, the cases that that applies to are, are serious cases where people have been injured or hurt, and, um, and there's a certain amount of responsibility that we have uh, to keep people safe from those individuals, um, and there is, and penal and punishment is part of it. Um, we, have, we have the persistent felony offender in the first degree that has, for class C felonies, so if you're 5 to 10 and you have two or more qualifying felonies and you're 21 years of age or older, you can be required to serve uh, what we call 10 flat, although there is some good time on that, so it can be seven and a half, eight years. Uh, these are prolific people that commit these crimes, and again, I, I'm okay with persistent felony offender in the first degree. Same with the mandatory minimums or the requirement that you serve on heroin and fentanyl. Um, I also work with Rob. We have a program, and he, it was mentioned in his bio, Project Safe Neighborhood. We're working together, and I know violent crime is not on this agenda, although it's a big deal um, in our community. Uh, we had a shooting at the Fayette Mall the other night. Um, people are nervous uh, about gun violence in our community, and so mandatory minimums are helpful to us when I'm looking at an individual who's a person that uh, my police officers know about, who carries a gun, who uses the gun, who's involved in, is always around when the gun is fired, and if they're committing a lot of crime, and I can't do much about it in terms of um, stepping in, uh, in, in terms of incarceration, if there are ways that we can deal with that person more severely and protect the community, I'm for it. Mr. Cameron, you have any thoughts from a policy perspective? Yeah, I, I think this might sound a little odd coming from me, but I'm actually uh, pretty in favor of, of mandatory minimums. Well, and the reason I say that is because I know that 
my law enforcement friends and uh, uh, prosecutors, they see that as a, a tool in the toolbox that allows them to go, some, go, go after some of these uh, you know, larger drug traffickers and individuals that are really uh, not nonviolent offenders, the folks that are <coughs> addicted to drugs. These are the individuals that are, are trafficking in drugs. And so I actually don't have, uh, smart on crime might not like me here saying that, but I actually don't have personally a, an issue with, with mandatory minimums. Uh, I also re recall that when I was working uh, for the majority leader, uh, there was an individual named Steve Cook who was the president of the uh, Association of Assistant United States Attorneys. And one of the things that he said that always stuck with me, and I think Ms. Redcorn kind of alluded to this, was the fact that you have to work really, really hard to get to a mandatory minimum. It's just not applied willy-nilly. Uh, and so I've always taken that under great consideration in, in, in this issue. What I think in terms of a policy perspective, I think what people, you know, from the president down, and I hate to sound like a broken record, but have started to acknowledge is that we have a drug addiction problem in this country. And so, you know, policy prescriptions in D.C. have been uh, passed, whether it be uh, uh, CARA Act or uh, just recently some additional treatment uh, policies that were, were passed by the Senate and the House and signed by the President that are supposed to help uh, increase treatment of opportunities for, for people um, that are really struggling with the addiction angle to this. So uh, from terms of a mandatory minimum problem, uh, I don't see that as an, a problem because I think uh, prosecutors use their discretion wisely in applying that and only do it in the uh, circumstances that require it. Thank you. Moving on, when I was a prosecutor, uh, when I would do my sentencing argument in front of the judge or the jury, whatever the case might be, there were generally five categories that I would discuss with them uh, as reasons for sentencing. General deterrence to others, specific deterrence to the accused, retribution, uh, preservation of good order, uh, and rehabilitation of the accused. It is the last one that I'd like to talk about. The First Step Act, as the judge mentioned earlier, has gained some attention in Congress and the President. Uh, it addresses rehabilitation of those that we have currently incarcerated and uh, deals with putting them back into society and reducing the recidivism rates. Now, Ms. Redcorn, you mentioned earlier you're seeing the same people over and over coming through on drug trafficking offenses or Possessions. possession Fair. offenses. Mm -hmm. What do you think we are doing well uh, with uh, combating recidivism, and what do you think we could do better as a society to help reentry of these individuals? Well, let me answer that second question first, um, and that is, uh, what can we do different or better? Um, I don't supervise individuals when they come back into our community. However, I know about 130 people reenter Fayette County each month either because they've been placed on probation by a circuit court judge, meaning they don't go to prison, uh, but they go back straight into the community with conditions, or they're released on parole by the Department of Corrections, also under supervision of the Department of Probation and Parole. So it's about 130 of them each month. Uh, we meet with them, we talk with them, we tell them what the expectations are. I was recently at a reentry meeting and gave my little spiel, and the guy who was coming out on parole leaned over and said to me, that's too preachy. Um, so maybe it is too preachy. Well, I asked our parole supervisor, um, if you could have anything, what would you ask for? I thought he was going to ask for money for more officers. What he told me is I'd like to have more people trained in a program called Thinking for Change. This is a program that I think is used in corrections around the country. And it really comes down to teaching individuals how to uh, understand their behavior how to control their behavior, how to monitor their behavior, and how to have empathy uh, for the people that sometimes their behavior is going to affect. Uh, going back to working with Rob, last week we had someone come to us from St. Louis uh, to talk to ministers. We gathered together, members, uh, ministers in our community, to talk, um, to hear from a guy who runs a de-escalation of violence program in St. Louis. And the thing that he talked to us about was there, are, there is a community of people out there that are falling between the cracks. 
And there's so many that fall between the cracks that there's actually a community of people out there for whom violence is a way of life where uh, frustrations build quickly, where there are addictions in the family, all kinds of dysfunctional things that are happening. And so we're raising up, in my mind, a generation of people um, who have a more difficult time coping in society. And what he, had ex what he, he explained to us, and this is going back to what the parole and probation supervisor told me, is this program, he feels like, is very useful to individuals that are coming out into the community. So I, I'm for listening to my probation and parole guy, who's actually spending time with these individuals, and, and doing what we can to provide all the services that we do, but also helping them rethink the way that they see the world. So, and I think my probation and parole people do a good job. I mean, they, they are, they want uh, their people to succeed, uh, but they also understand that if they don't, there need to be consequences. And um, when there's not consequences for bad behavior, bad behavior persists. Judge, maybe you can give us the view from the bench on that one. Well, uh, we, you know, we talk about the same factors, maybe in different, words in terms of uh, the sentences that are imposed, and rehabilitation is, is certainly a key factor. Um, I think rehabilitation, where we're really falling down, is uh, at the Bureau of Prisons level. In my, in my, in my personal opinion, the BOP is not doing enough in terms of vocational education, and it's unable to provide the type of training programs and compensation for work while a person's incarcerated. So we're releasing a lot of people back into the community that uh, they may have been a little better educated in terms of getting a GED, but perhaps not much more than that. They may have gotten some vocational training, but it may not be the type of training that's going to be useful in today's environment. Um, we're attempting to address addiction problems, but again, it's kind of a one size fits all, so I think we need to be a little more select in terms of the uh, programs that are being provided through the BOP. BOP takes a lot of pressure from a lot of different sources, and you can see that through some of the legislation that, we, that we've mentioned. The First Step Act, for example, there's a focus more on compassionate release for older individuals, the ones that are not harmful, not likely to reoffend. But um, if I had a magic wand, if I could change anything about the P BOP, it would be to provide meaningful vocational education programs and be able to pay inmates while they're working to, to build up a fund so that when they come out and they're on the street, uh, you know, they're not penniless. They're not starting from scratch. And, and until we do that, I think we're going to continue to see those high levels of recidivism. Mr. Cameron? Yeah, well, I think it's, thanks. I think it's probably important just for everybody's sort of general, general education is to kind of, kind of explain what we're talking about when we talk about criminal justice reform, right? So we're talking about either front-end reform or back-end reform. Front-end generally uh, makes up, you know, sentencing. Uh, what, we talked about mandatory minimums. That's front-end sort of uh, issues. And then you've got the back-end side. And so the back-end uh, deals with, you know, you know, what do you do with somebody as they are re-entering re into society? And so for a long time, I think the model has been punishment and consequence, which is appropriate, and we need that. But I also think now uh, some of the policy thinkers on this issue, uh, Jared Kushner and others that are in the White House uh, and some in the Senate and some in the House, are now looking at, okay, we need to punish these people and there needs to be a consequence for their action. But once they've served their time, once they've um, uh, uh, finished and completed their sentence, what do we do after the fact? And so there's been a real, I don't want to say shift, but a push to incorporate rehabilitation. And so. One of the things, um, we talked about the First Step Act, in which I think that's probably um, a good bill in terms of the reentry component, is that it really incentivizes inmates uh, to get a voc you know, vocational skill or, or some sort of trade uh, so that when they move back into society, uh, they're able to uh, sustain themselves and, and build a future that doesn't uh, ultimately end up or result in them coming back into prison. Um, it, so I see that as a good policy prescription that's coming out of, out of Washington, D.C. 
um, the way they incentivize inmates to join these vocational programs uh, is something called earned, uh, earned credits, earned time credits, which if you do vocational training or any sort of educational training, uh, you get a little bit of a reduction on your sentence. That obviously incentivizes an inmate to go through those programs. There's also an expansion of good time credits within the First Step Act uh, that if you're on good behavior while you're in jail or in prison, uh, you also get a little bit of a reduction in your sentence. I think, you know, candidly, these are good things that, you know, if we can get folks in a mindset of re-entering into society, being rehabilitated and moving into a productive uh, citizen uh, back in their community, that's better because I think it uh, reduces the chances that they might recidivate. I, I think in Kentucky, uh, just as an example, uh, now this is moving back to the state system, but uh, after three years, I think three to five years, the recidivism rate is 47 percent. That's just unacceptable, right? So what are we doing here in Kentucky uh, to change that? I know there's been some good work done. I'm hopeful that in the upcoming legislative session we'll continue to be able to do work uh, that will allow for us to uh, see a positive trend in those numbers as opposed to uh, an increase in, in those recidivism rates. Kind of feel like a judge up here, so counsel, I'm ready for your summation. <laughs> <laughs> well, Andrew, I, I certainly uh, don't want to comment on, on any uh, particular pending legislation, but I, I will echo uh, something that Judge Reeves said and, and something that Mr. Cameron touched on, uh, the need for education. I think that is a, a certainly a key for those folks that are incarcerated to have educational and, and vocational opportunities. And the BOP does afford um, some of that already. I think continuing with that education and vocational opportunities when folks are released back out into uh, society. One thing that we have in the federal system that I think uh, the court does a very good job of is with its uh, supervised release program as monitored by the uh, federal probation officers. The goal of the program is for the individual that is released to succeed. And they're given many opportunities uh, along the way. They're given um, job counseling, uh, life skills counseling, drug addiction counseling if they need it, all with the uh, oversight of the probation officer and ultimately the court. And if there are uh, missteps along the way, uh, repeated violations, then there are sanctions. And the folks are held accountable for their actions. But nobody, uh, the prosecutors, the, um, the judge, the defense attorney, nobody wants to see these individuals fail. The purpose of the program uh, is, is success. And it's uh, great when we see somebody that we've prosecuted uh, goes off and does their time and we never hear from them again on supervised release. That means that, um, that it's working on that end. And I think even going a step uh, away from that, back to the beginning, my remarks talking about prevention. I think prevention on the front end, both um, on the drug arena and also in the violent crime area, the more that we can prevent folks, uh, the more that we can show folks that there are other options to, um, to the path of criminal activity, uh, the better. And I think that's where uh, we have and can continue to focus our resources uh, effectively. Thank you. And we have a few minutes left, so I'm going to go on to our fourth topic, but I would like to leave a little time at the end to ha have questions from the audience, so if we could keep our comments brief. Here in Kentucky, there's been a lot of discussion about bail reform. Uh, in the grand scheme of things, is threat assessment bail uh, appropriate, or is bail that is set uh, by someone's ability to pay or a monetary bail system better, or is there some other option out there that we should be considering here in Kentucky? Mr. Cameron? Sir, well, I, I, I think that, um, you know, getting away from a means-based testing system that we currently have, I, for most, many of you all know how the, the bail system works here, but, uh, you know, it's, it's basically largely based on your ability to pay. And so the Pegasus Institute did a study um, back in 20, uh, or that captured 2016, uh, that showed, oh, sorry about that. That, that showed that, uh, that folks um, that were not able to post bail, it, it disproportion disproportionately impacted folks uh, that were, were poor in our, in our communities. And so you'd find that you'd have 64,000 across the Commonwealth <laughs> individuals uh, that were in jail awaiting trial 
uh, that were there for nonviolent offense simply because they could not afford their, afford their, afford their bail, whereas uh, the study reported that roughly 1,000 individuals who had committed some sort of violent act um, were at home um, just simply because they could pay uh, and afford the bail. That seems to be out of whack in terms of a, a system that on this topic, there's great concern that, that the assessment itself would be based on some sort of algorithm. I'm not in favor of an algorithm. I, I believe folks, I believe judges, um, you know, with, at the state level, uh, we vote these people in because we believe in their, their, uh, their acumen and their ability to make these sorts of determinations. Um, and so I, I'm not in favor of a system that just foolhardily takes into consideration an algorithm and makes the assessment of whether somebody um, uh, should be in jail or be out of jail. But I think having a judge make that determination uh, um, based on the risk factor or the risk assessment of an individual that is in front of them, uh, the characteristics of that person is a better test uh, or better system uh, than simply looking at somebody's ability to, to pay um, uh, to determine whether they are in jail or out of jail. Ms. Redcorn, what, what are your thoughts on that and how would you see that affecting state prosecutions? Well, the decision about whether someone should be released, the judge looks, does look at an assessment, and I thought it came from an algorithm, but uh, I think it does. Um, but based on the likelihood of reoffending and um, or being a danger to the community and um, coming back to court. Are they gonna come back to court if you let them out? And for most of the violent offenses, those individuals stay incarcerated. So if we um, have a, a program where we're gonna release people when there are nonviolent offenses, so we're talking about drugs, burglaries, thefts, uh, people breaking into your car, using your credit card, things like that, then I think at least the judges need to have some ability to control the behavior while individuals are released. And I go back to the thing about drugs. Um, just telling people, okay, I'm gonna let you out on your own recognizance, don't break any laws, and make sure that you come back to court, and we're setting up those people not to, we're setting them up to, to be violated. Um, so let's, let's collectively come up with some ideas and resource to, to better monitor behavior. We've now had some judges that actually set curfews uh, for individuals, even for 19 and 20 year old individuals to be uh, home at a certain time or, or live with your mom or grandmother or aunt or whomever. So um, I think that uh, th there's gonna be bail reform. I think it's coming and I think as prosecutors, at least this prosecutor, I wanna have some input on what, what help me here, help me figure out what we can put into place so that people don't go out and commit another crime in, against, sometimes against another person. Thank you. Now, I understand the bail system works differently on the federal level, so maybe you have a different view. It does. The, the, the release system in, uh, in the federal court is different, I believe, than, than the state system. Um, our calculus is based on whether the person is going to be a uh, risk of danger to the community or is a risk of flight or failure to uh, not show up for the next court appearance. Uh, there are certain cases, uh, certain types or classes of offenses in the federal system, uh, those involving violence, uh, those involving significant uh, amounts of, uh, of uh, drugs, that there is a presumption of detention if the government so asks, then the burden shifts to the defendant to, uh, to establish that he or she has met that presumption. Uh, but in all cases, the government when seeking detention must show that the person is either a risk of flight or a danger to the community. Um, and I believe Judge Reeves could probably speak certainly better on this topic than, than I could, but from a, a prosecutor's perspective, um, you know, we want to seek detention in the cases that those folks are, are most violent, that are causing the most harm in our communities, that are um, moving large amounts of drugs, that are engaged in uh, offenses against children those folks that we don't think are going to show back up for the next court appearance. If there's a risk of flight, we want to see detention in those cases. Um, the probation office does a very good job of evaluating the risk factors and presenting a report both to the parties and to the court about their assessment of whether a person um, can be released or not. And we um, very often will agree with 
the judgment of the uh, pretrial services officer. Um, so I, I think the cases that we seek detention, uh, in those cases we're doing so uh, appropriately and, and with good reason. Last word, Judge. Well, I, I agree with all of those comments. The bail reform in the federal system is called magistrate judges. <laughs> uh, if you have good magistrate judges that work closely with probation officers, and if they get good recommendations from assistant U.S. attorneys, the system seems to work pretty well. Uh, there's the ability then to appeal those determinations to the district court. We don't get a lot. Uh, I'd say probably 2 to 5% those decisions are appealed and uh, the attorneys seem pretty satisfied with the system that we have in place. Now I think at the federal level there probably are more people held pretrial than at the state level, but it's also selective prosecution for, for the most part. Uh, they do bring some pretty serious cases and so uh, we really have not had those, those issues. Thank you. Uh, I'd like to thank the panel, um, but I'd also, we have a little time left, so I'd like to open it up to the floor to ask any questions. I think if you could just proceed to the microphone if you have a question for the panel, that would be helpful. Sir? Please. As a resident legislator, would you like to take this question? Well, I, Ben, thanks for that question. I, I honestly think that, um, and you kind of said this towards the end, that I think the legislature should take the role. I mean, uh, Mr. Duncan, Rob has said this, and I think Ms. Redcorn has alluded to this as fact, right? They, they are in the business of enforcing the law, right, in the executive branch. And so it's on the legislature uh, to make the, the policy judgments and the determinations about what is appropriate related to a whole host of issues, right, the mandatory minimum. And some of that they've given over to the United States Sentencing Commission to make those determinations. But I, you know, I mean, look, we are all, for the most part, I think, members of the Federal Society, and so we believe um, that the judiciary should um, be in the business of interpreting the law but not getting into a uh, their views on, on public policy or, or making policy prescriptions from the bench. And so it's my estimate and my judgment that the legislature uh, should be in that business. Uh, and uh, I think, um, you know, I don't, uh, I think there's been some, some movement in that regard, whether it be the First Step Act or whether it be the president saying that he's in support of the First Step Act or reentry efforts. The front end reforms is a much different, much larger discussion. There are people that are not, simply are not um, comfortable with making some of those changes just simply because of the, the fear that it would endanger public safety. And so you have to go about that in a slow and methodical way. Um, but in terms of getting back to your question, uh, uh, I think it's the role of the legislature to make policy, to make the law, and, and for, for judges to interpret it. So I, I think that individual was probably a little bit misguided in saying that uh, <laughs> Uh, that there are, should be criminal justice reform-minded individuals that sit, sit on the bench. Would anyone else like to chime in on that? Let me just add well, just one footnote to that. Um, it's, it's been my good fortune to be able to sit with some really, really good appellate judges. District courts get, or judges get to sit by designation from time to time. And uh, so I've been, I've been doing that for 14 years probably or longer with the Sixth Circuit and, and now with the, with the Eleventh Circuit. And I can tell you 
that the judges, the appellate judges that I've interacted with at those, with those courts, they don't want to be criminal justice reform minded or anything else. They just want to be a good judge and do the job. And we're lucky that we have some really, really good ones. Uh, we really are, and it's not just in the circuit, but it's really throughout the country. So the person that, in my opinion, that, that writes that probably has too much time on their hands and probably should be looking at some other areas for their, for their writings. Well, I know better than to stand in the way of a large group of lawyers and lunch. So on that note, I think we'll wrap up. Jeff, is there anything else we need to do? All right, well, thank you all so much. We appreciate your time and attendance here today.